Take our Bibles and open them to Galatians chapter 6. We're coming to the very end of our series, and hopefully it's been a blessing to you. I like to teach through expositionally, and what that means is we go through it word by word and phrase by phrase. Sometimes the messages might be topical, like a little bit this morning we talked about hope and having the answer of hope, and the text of scripture was um, certainly from 1 Peter 3, but we looked at other passages, and so sometimes that's what's referred to as being topical, it's more of a subject-based. But here as we're going through the book of Galatians, Paul again, the theme of this is certainly understanding the gospel. And again, just by way of refreshing our minds with our theme, what did we say that the gospel is? What is the gospel? The death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And Paul says, if any man preaches another gospel, it's the good news. It's the message that's proclaimed. So a, an evangelist is one who preaches the gospel. I want you to think about th this time where you were able to clearly present the gospel. The last time that you had an opportunity to do that. Do you remember that? You're thinking about, you're talking about, and it may be sometimes when you're talking to an unsaved person, you know the person uh, most likely does not know Christ as their Savior. And so as you're explaining to them the gospel, they, they, they might have kind of like a, a furled brow or maybe kind of like their eyes are wide open or kind of, I'm not sure what you're talking about. But we must never forget the message is good news. The Spirit takes the word, plants the seed, and there's work and activity that's going on in the heart of a, belief, of a person that may have yet to believe. We have to always remember that. It's not us trying to persuade them or convince them. The Word of God is a living book. The Spirit of God takes that. And so when Paul was writing about that, he says, my preaching and my teaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but rather a demonstration of what? The Spirit and of power. So when we're talking to our unsaved neighbor, we're talking to a relative that seems like a, a hard nut to crack, we're talking to a coworker, or whoever it may be, we proclaim the gospel. We're not trying to change its message. We're not trying to uh, you know, substitute certain words to make it softer. We preach that Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried, on the th and on the third day he rose again. Hallelujah. So it doesn't matter if it's a missionary talking to someone who may be foreign to that. The word of God is explained and taught, and we must remember that. So having said that, as we, uh, we, we get all the way to the end of this letter, and we started in uh, verse 16 uh, a few weeks ago. I'm not exactly sure when the last time I preached. It was probably at least three Sundays ago. We looked at the fruit of the Christian gospel. Okay, So that's what Paul was talking about uh, in verses 16 all the way to the end of the chapter about what flows from being saved, being filled with the Spirit, the lust of the flesh, wars against the, the Spirit, and so forth. Uh, let's start reading in verse 1 of Galatians chapter 6. And we're only going to read the first six verses tonight, okay? And we're probably going to just focus on verses 1 and 2. And I want to ask you a question um, after we read this section that hopefully will spark a little bit of uh, curiosity and get things going as we think about how we can understand this in reference to the ministry of restoration. All right, let's begin reading. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault... Ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden." Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. I'm curious, how many of you have ever been in a position, or maybe you are currently, where you were either a lifeguard or you were someone that was responsible for administering CPR? Would you raise your hand? Okay, look around. Keep your hands up if you, if you don't mind. One, two, three, four, five, six. Now, you put your hands down. Thank you. Um, I've never been a lifeguard, but... I consider myself the lifeguard of my swimming pool, and I mean that. I told my friend Dave, who just bought a house, he has a beautiful swimming pool. I said, you have to be neurotic about your children when it comes to a pool. I am the last one out. 
I get upset if my rules aren't followed. I tell the kids they're not allowed in the pool. And it's just, I'm very adamant about that. And uh, having said that, I know that some of you are nurses and some of you know how to do CPR. I know how to do CPR. It's just been a little bit since I had that course. I'm not sure if we're going to have the staff learn it, do CPR training this year or not for the school. So uh, about five years ago, Michelle Mannion was teaching a health and CPR class here at the school. And for whatever reason, she wasn't able to be there. And so Pastor Miller asked me to cover the class. I said, sure, no problem. It's on a Wednesday afternoon. I remember it like it was yesterday. And um, so she had some videos that she wanted me to show. And I was under the impression that the video that we were going to watch was a, a reenactment of someone who had drowned and actually was, this is how you do CPR. And so it was, we started the film and I explained to the students that this is how it was going to be, that this was a reenactment of a person who drowned at a beach. And so have you ever watched those shows where they're like a reenactment and then they've got, you know, they, they kind of the angle, the camera angles are in the perfect spot. Well, all of a sudden, this is a person kind of with a shaky camera on the beach. I said, wow, they've got a, they've got a lot of people involved in this reenactment. There's like hundreds of people for this. And I'm going, I don't know if this is a reenactment. <laughs> all right, let's keep watching. And so the lifeguard blows his whistle, runs out into the beach, and there's two guys that are just kind of standing there. They're just kind of talking. And they're up to about their waist in water. And all of a sudden, the lifeguard comes right next to them, swims like between them, comes up with a person. Brings that person to the shore. They begin administering CPR. The whole time in my mind, I'm thinking, wow, this is really real. Then I'm saying, this is not fake. This is the real thing. And I don't know how they just whoever gave the rights for it apparently it was some beach in australia and these were three college students from taiwan and it was just really weird and just and i had never seen someone resuscitated i'd seen videos of fake people being resuscitated but not real people have you ever is anybody i mean you can find anything on youtube now but i'm just saying it was one of those things where I'm watching this and all of the kids, I mean, these are kids that you couldn't get quiet for about, you know, you get, get them quiet for about five minutes and they just want to talk. It was at the end of the day, everybody's tired. And there was, every eyeball was glued to the screen watching this. And I went, wow. And they saved this guy. And it was amazing. And I'm watching this going, okay, class, any discussion? And it was just this total silence. I can't help but think about that when I read what we just read in Galatians 6, verse 1. And what we see here are instructions to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ to help someone who has been overtaken in sin, to help resuscitate that person, not help them to get saved again. That's impossible. That's not what it's saying here at all. But it's someone who has been overtaken after the, end of the vid after the end of the CPR and the kid came to and everything and his friend, it was so weird because the two friends were right next to him and didn't realize that he was drowning. So weird. And actually, drowning is never, help, I'm drowning. It's never that way. It's often not, not that way. It's oftentimes people who can't communicate, who can't say anything, and before you know it, they're there. And somehow that lifeguard had been watching and saw one go down under and went, there was three guys there, and I only see two, and he ran out there, swam out there, and he got them. Why am I saying all this? Well, if you've ever done CPR, I know my wife has, um, in an attempt to even bring someone back to life, and others of you that have had that responsibility of being a lifeguard, my good friend Dave, his son is a lifeguard, um, it, I'm sure you have to keep your wits about you. You have to know what you're doing. You have to see the final goal. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Tonight I want to be talking about something that is vital to the health of our church, and that is the ministry of restoration. What is given to us in these verses are powerful and oftentimes overlooked because we may not realize what is actually happening in the lives of people. Now, I'm not saying it's everybody's responsibility to know what everybody's doing. Oftentimes when we come to church, we're, we're giving our best. We're dressing up nice. We're looking good. We're making sure that our kids are presentable. We're here at the church, and everybody sees the best of us. Nobody knows, or maybe very few people know, 
perhaps what we're watching, what we're looking at, what we're dealing with, what we're thinking, but God does. So I want to tonight, I want to look very carefully at some things involved in this verse, in the, in the following verse, in this particular portion of the letter that Paul is advocating to the church to do. All right? So, first of all, I want us to notice that the practice of Christian love is to not only be mindful of those in physical need, which we really do need to be mindful of that. The Bible says, look not every man on his own things, but rather the things of others. So if we see somebody in need, we're to help them. That is, that is what the church should be about in, in, in that regard. I mean, obviously we're about propagating the gospel and discipling and so forth, but I mean as we see people who are in need. The early church had problems with some of the widows who were in need, and that's the beginning of what we call deacons today to take care of some of those physical needs. But to be truly aware of those in spiritual need. So here's what happens. Truly heartfelt people sincerely love God, and this is what happens. The toughest part is often, how do I help? How do I do it? You know what? If you don't really know CPR, you can actually do damage to the person that you're trying to save. I remember hearing that. I'm thinking, do you start with compressions first? Do you want to keep the heart beating? Or do you want to get oxygen? I don't know. They kind of go back and forth on what you're supposed to do. I don't want to turn into some medical debate here, but you know, what, what is it that you, you're supposed to do? I mean, someone's coughing. Why are they coughing? You know, someone is seizing. How, how do you stop that? You may not know exactly what's going on. Oftentimes, too, in the church, we might see somebody who's struggling. You might say, hey, we're so-and-so. Or that person seems down. Or that person seems this or that. We don't know what to do. And I've said this before. Pastor Miller and I are aware of every single person who hasn't been here um, in a while and um, that we love. As the pastors of the church, that is our job. And so sometimes we just aren't at liberty to explain that, nor would I ever from the pulpit or even in a setting like this or even on a Wednesday night. That's not our, my place to ever do that. But sometimes we wonder, hey, I, some, so the, the reason I'm saying that is that the way that we love sometimes is expressed in, in, in different ways and sometimes our, our area of concern might create a greater problem. So we, we have to be careful that sometimes our prayer requests, our gossip, and our concerns that we have turn into things that cause more uh, confusion. So when we love people, how do we truly help them? Well, Paul tells us some things that I think we really need to think about very carefully tonight, and I want to challenge you in a couple ways. All right, so here we go. Helping your brother out of a sinful pit. Are you able to do that? Notice very carefully, Paul reminds them of who they are. He says, brethren. What does that imply? Brethren means brothers and sisters in Christ. It is a title of God's people. This is not written ambiguously to every single person. He's writing specifically, and I think specifically to the leaders of the church, but those who are capable of helping. Now, notice what it says. If a man be overtaken in a fault. If you're taking notes tonight, I want you to note very carefully that the Greek word for overtaken only appears three other places in the New Testament. I've wrestled with this. I know the word. It's proslambano. So I read that in the Greek, and I say, okay, and I... Figure it out, pros means first, and lambano means to take, but to take in, a, in the wrong order. In fact, the same Greek word here for, for overtaken is used in 1 Corinthians 11 when Paul is saying, some of you are coming to the Lord's table and you're taking um, it and you're not treating it with reverence. You're doing something against the order that it should be. All right? Does that make sense? Sometimes the best commentary of Scripture is itself. So you have to kind of, that's why it's good to go to the original and you look at the, those words and say, okay, pro slumbano. So what does that mean here? How is that overtaken? Because it's not translated overtaken in 1 Corinthians 11. Something that is out of order. Something that isn't right. Something that needs to be put back in alignment. Have you ever watched those videos of people that are getting their... their um, uh, their spines realigned, and I'm scared to death to go to a chiropractor. Some people are like, I go there, I live by them, amen, for some of you. And for me, it's oh me, I wouldn't say amen. I'm scared to do that. I'm just afraid they're going to crack my neck the wrong way, and I'm going to be stuck like this the rest of my life. And some of you, you tell me, oh, it's the best thing ever. And I'm, I'm sure it is for you. I'm just scared to do it. But that's kind of the idea here. It's, it's overtaken. Something's out of balance. Something isn't right. 
In fact, some commentators believe that it's actually connected to something like a ship that has been overtaken by a wave and that it's knocked it off itself and it can't right itself. So there's a number of different ways of looking at this passage. Notice the word fault there. It says if someone is overtaken in a fault. What's interesting, we look at this and say, well, is that the same as sin? Well, yes, it is. It's not one of the, the main words for sin or transgression, but it is a fault. Some commentators would say, well, you know, this means that maybe it was, wasn't a premeditated sin. It was more like somebody found themselves in a, in a situation. They made some wrong decisions, perhaps. But here's the point, is that we're here for one another to help one another. Oftentimes, people that fall into sin, they end up leaving, and we never see them again. So there's no opportunity for restoration. It's kind of like they, they leave, and, and in some cases, it, like especially some who may be in a position of leadership, they may have done something wrong that's worthy of them resigning and stepping down and perhaps moving on. I get that. But if we're supposed to help somebody be restored, the idea is that they have something in their life that needs to be fixed so that they can get it right and move on with their life and still be able to function properly in the church. So let's think about this. First of all, the fallen believer who is in need. If a man be overtaken in a fault. Now, some would argue, well, there's a million people that we could look to and say, how many people have been overtaken in a fault? I don't believe the man that's being used here, this word anthropos, is a word that's meaning just anybody out there. We're supposed to help somebody who's a drug addict or somebody who's this. That's not the point. I don't think that's the instruction that Paul has given. This is someone who is a believer. This is someone who is saved. This is someone who's being restored to a position. You can't restore something if it's never been something before. All right, that's silly, I know, but you can't, you're not restoring an unsaved person to say, hey, you were once a good person. Let's try to get you back to being a good person. That is what the world teaches, and that's why a lot of the programs that are out there to kind of help people who, with addictions, are, they're, they're limited because you're, there's nothing good in us. There's nothing righteous in us. We need to understand that the emptiness inside of us can only be filled by the personal relationship with our Heavenly Father through the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so having said that, this is a fallen believer in need. A couple thoughts, if you're taking notes, I want you to know. First of all, the Greek word for overtaken, as I said before, carries with it the idea of something that, is overwhelmed, that, that has overwhelmed or taken by surprise a true believer like a wave overtakes a ship in the midst of the sea. How do we see that? Something is out of line. Something isn't right. So how do we deal with that person? Now, some people who have the gift of prophecy, and they may even be choleric, I'm describing myself, may have to at times bite their tongue because they see somebody doing something wrong and they just want to tell that person, you're doing something wrong. But it may not be the right time to tell somebody that they're doing something wrong. Amen? Amen? <laughs> okay, right. That happens. Nobody wants to admit that they have, have ever done that or felt that way. Other times it may be that somebody is doing something wrong and we kind of just want to pretend like we didn't see it. I didn't see that. And so that's the cool parent. That's the one that lets their kids get away with things or, or the, even sometimes the cool teacher who's pretending that he didn't or she didn't see something. So we are looking at this, it's not about being passive. And it's not about somebody being condemning. There is a middle ground of being someone who is concerned, loving, and willing to help somebody get back in line, okay? Now, you might say, again, that kind of goes back to the original question. How do I help? How do I do this? How is this taking place? Is there some board? Is there some council? Is there some sin committee that exists in the church that I don't know about? I've never stood before one, um, and I hope I don't have to. No, there isn't. But, so, but primarily, those are things that, that I would deal with, but it's not necessarily just limited to me, and I'll explain that in just a moment. Also, I want you to notice tonight that the Greek word for fault means a sin or offense. So we're not talking about something that somebody did accidentally. That's why sometimes the analogy of a ship be overtaken in a, in a wave, it's like, well, it's not the ship's fault. All sin is decision-based, okay? It's not a sin to be tempted. Are you with me tonight, church? It's not a sin to be tempted. It's a sin to give in to the temptation. But sometimes somebody might not realize the severity of their decision. And they do things that cause greater problems, like someone who falls into a pit and they can't get out. They try and they try and they try. Have you ever seen 
uh, videos of those large uh, aquatic, well, the, the, the sea turtles that get flipped over on their back. And there's, there's people that try to help them get, them get them right set up so they can go. So oftentimes Christians might get to this place where they go, well, if I tell anybody about the sin that I'm struggling with, then that would just be too embarrassing, and I don't need anybody to help me, and I can figure this out, and it just gets worse and worse and worse. Because that person doesn't understand God's grace and perhaps doesn't even understand how the church is to function, that the person never gets the help that they need to get out of their sinful pit. And this is something that's very interesting, worth noting. If a man be overtaken in a fault, the believer has transgressed and is in need of help. So how do we respond? How do we respond? Well, he has wandered from the fold, as in a place where he cannot get out. It's interesting. We wonder sometimes, why do sheep do that? Why do sheep do that? Have you ever stepped back and go, why did I say that? Why did I do that? Remember the prodigal son comes to himself and says, what am I doing in uh, this pig pit? He came to himself. When we are running away from God, we want to get as far away as we can. What did Jonah do? He got the ticket of the, of the boat of the farthest spot he could go, to, thinking that he could run away from God and his responsibilities to fulfill what God had called him to do. And so sometimes that's what we do. When we're involved in sinful activity, when we, we've been overtaken, when we, our better judgment has not been exercised, sometimes we run, sometimes we don't think it's a big deal, sometimes we just try to figure it out, sometimes we just kind of sweep it under the proverbial rug. And you might say, well, it's not my place to judge. I'm not saying to judge. I'm saying that sometimes it might be confrontation that is involved with somebody that you love, and it may be that somebody comes to you and says, I'm not sure what to do. Sometimes there are things that, yes, that um, I may deal with that stays private, no one's ever going to know about it, but sometimes there are other things, depending on the situation, that may involve other things. But what's the, what's the point here? If brethren have been challenged to think about the people who have been overtaken in a fall, where does that lead us to? Well, it leads us to consider who is able to help. And that's my challenge tonight. Are you that kind of person that can help? I want us to notice, first of all, that the call for qualified counselors to help bring about restoration in the life of a wayward believer is spirit-filling, not just pity or concern. So it's more than just saying, I want to help. I really hope I'll be praying for you. It's someone who is able to help. Paul is very clear on this. Let's keep reading. Notice what it says. He says, ye, and ye is the plural or singular of, of you. It's plural, right? Thou is singular. So he says ye. He's talking to the brethren. He's talking to the church. He's given instruction to those who are able to do this. He says ye which are, what's the next word? Spiritual. And here's the thing that's interesting, church, is that sometimes people who aren't necessarily strong believers will try to use this word in a condescending way. Well, you think you're so spiritual. No, I realize who I am, and I've submitted myself over to God, and a spiritual person doesn't wear his, uh, his, his relationship with God on his forehead for everyone to know. The person just lives it out. It's interesting that going back to the first deacons, that the apostles said, we must give ourselves to prayer and to studying of the word. Choose among you seven men. Why the number seven? No idea. Is it some magical number? Is it some... Biblical number, I think they just said seven. Maybe that's what God told them to, 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 to how many to choose. Some people think there were thousands of people in the first church in Jerusalem. But he says, choose seven men of honest report. And then what's the next uh, uh, characteristic of a person who's supposed to serve as a deacon? What does it say? Anybody know? It's in Acts, Acts chapter 6. Someone who is spirit-filled. And say, somebody who is good with accounting. Or somebody who's good with money. And those are all fine and good if you're good with money. But more importantly than that is somebody who is spirit-filled. Well, how would they know who that person is? They have some type of, uh, you know, some, some voting that would take place in the church that everybody is kind of, you know, uh, like we have when somebody's running for school board or for representative or congress or something like that. I mean, how do they know? When somebody is truly spiritual, they're the person that demonstrates it because they're like Christ. They're humble. 
They're the person that you go to because you know that when you go to them, they're going to give you a solid answer. They're the person that you know if you ask them to pray for you, they will pray. There is something that you see in them. And so Paul's instruction is, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual. Those of you who are spiritual. Well, does that mean that there are some that weren't spiritual? The answer is, yeah, they weren't maybe as spiritual as they could have been. See, a spirit-filled person is controlled by the spirit, and what would they demonstrate? Well, go back up. Look back in chapter 5. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, uh, temperance, faith. They would have discernment. They wouldn't be telling everybody. They would know how to handle it. The Bible says love covers a multitude of sins. And so they would know how to deal with it properly. They would know how to bring about that restoration. So it's important that we remember that. The Greek word for restore involves repairing the problem. Not sitting around and talking about the problem. It reminds me of two guys that were arguing over how to, how to fix a leak in their boat. They said, if we keep talking about it and never try to fix it, we're going to sink. And that's sometimes what people do. They just talk about their problems and they never want to deal with them. They never know how to deal with it because all they're doing is coming up with theories and ideas. Let's fix this problem. Ye which are spiritual, the next word church, you'll notice, is restore. And it's a powerful word. It actually is also translated mended. So spiritually speaking, we are to help restore so that the fallen believer can once again be a useful part of the fellowship of believers. You might say, well, Pastor Small, aren't there situations where somebody has done something uh, that's criminal? That's not what we're talking about here at all. We're not talking about somebody that has broken the law. We're not talking about something that, that, that is serious here. We are, not that it's not serious, but we're not talking about something to that level. We're talking about somebody who has gotten involved in a, in a sin, sinful entanglement that they need help and they need to be pointed in the right direction and they need that restoration. This ministry is vital, but oftentimes overlooked. And I want us to think about this. The overtaken ones need to be restored. Do you see that clearly? Do you see that clearly in verse 1, church? It says, restore such a one. But notice, and I found this, this is not original with me, and I'll always admit that, but sometimes I, I don't know where I found it, I just came across this in my study. They're not to be ignored, that sometimes happens, sometimes intentionally. They're not to be excused, sweep it under the rug. They're not to be destroyed, which I've seen that happen. The goal is always restoration. So church, let me ask you this honestly, what does that look like? What does that look like? When someone is in that position where they're struggling with a sin, and we help them, we restore them. You might say, well, that's a work that God does in their hearts. Of course. But it is also something that we help facilitate. We're giving them counsel. We're pointing them to the word. We're becoming accountability partners with them. We're helping them. We're, we're coming alongside them. The reason I have a picture of somebody fixing a net is because, as I said before, that's that word. The word restoration, if you were to look that up, it's also translated as mending or mended or to mend. The Bible says that Jesus came to James and John and they were mending their nets, the same Greek word for restore. He said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So what do we see here? Something that's broken that needs to be fixed. Something that isn't working right that needs to be restored. What do we have a tendency of doing sometimes, and I'm guilty of this, with something that's broken? What do we do with it? We throw it away. And sometimes that's not a bad thing to do because it might be not worth fixing. But if you take the time to try to restore something, there's something neat about that. It may take a long time. It's a restoration process. I know some of you enjoy doing that, and praise God for you. But notice the attitude that's involved in this. The attitude of restoration is, is vital. The spirit of meekness is the proper attitude when dealing with an overtaken soul. If you have your bulletins, I want you to go there for a moment. If you have your bulletin, I want you to, to, to see something very interesting. When I do the little article each uh, week for From the Pastor's Heart, I try to do something that's relating to either an event that has happened, is going to happen, or perhaps something connected with the sermon. And I said, in Scripture, the word hope reminds me of the word meekness. It is often misunderstood and overlooked as being the powerful word that it is. And I meant that because I knew that I was going to be talking about meekness tonight. Hope is not wishful thinking, but it's, it's a confident expectation based upon the unchanging word and God's promises. But meekness is not weakness. 
Now, it's interesting. Look up, weak, or look up meekness in a secular dictionary and see what you'll find. Not how we would understand it today. It's interesting. Some of the dictionaries that I found had it as passive, pushover. You know, some of the synonyms were really, really just like, that's not what I think about. Was Jesus a passive pushover? So what is meekness? Why am I asking you that? Because verse 1 says, restore such a one. You are the channel by which God uses to help somebody who's struggling with a sin that has overtaken them. But how do we go about doing it? Not, a, not in a condemning way, not in a passive way, not in a permissive way, but in a powerful way. The power is a spirit of meekness. So what is meekness? What is meekness? Notice it says, in the spirit of meekness. It is strength under control. It's the ability to follow orders. Anybody want to add to that? How would you define meekness? Mary? Grace under pressure. Okay, Dave? Humble. Very much so. And I want you to think about both of those definitions that were given relate to what I'm about to say right here. The Apostle Paul suggests that gentleness, or this, the spirit of meekness, is born from a sense of our own weakness and proneness to sin. So we don't act like, I can't believe you did this. What were you thinking? Now, sometimes we do that with our kids. And then I'm reminded of what my parents said, I can't wait till you have kids to do this. I go, now I know how I understand. Now I know the pain I put my parents through. But notice very carefully, as we're going through this carefully, Paul's instructions. The spirit of meekness, it's a humility, it's grace under pressure, it's not weakness, it's the ability to, to follow directions. You're not doing your own thing your own way. But he says, considering thyself, which is basically... Now it's personalized individually. Thyself is, is singular. Considering thyself. Those of you that are capable of spiritually restoring someone, be mindful. You know what's sad sometimes is to hear about lifeguards who drowned in an effort to save those that were rescuing. That's always awful. And we're happy that the person was saved, but sometimes you look at this and say, I wonder what happened. You know usually what happens? The person being rescued starts panicking and they start pushing down on the person that's trying to prop them up. Can that happen? It could. What, what really has Paul been dealing with in this entire letter? The issues of grace, liberty, and the law. Legalism. And so I think that perhaps this could be related to that. There could be some things linked to that. That's saying, hey, in your effort... Just consider yourself. You're trying to deal with somebody who's unsure about their righteousness. Don't become a licentious person. Perhaps that's what he means by this. I think we also have to be mindful of the very fact, and I've felt this before, and I don't know how to describe it, and I don't want to go into great detail because there's children in the room, but there are times when I'm dealing with something, and I'm talking about over the last 20 years of ministry, that somebody's describing something, and then all of a sudden those things that they're struggling with become things that I can't seem to get out of my mind and my heart. So we have to be mindful of that. That's why the instruction is there. Considering thyself. Be mindful. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. It says, lest thou also be, what's the next word? Tempted. Tempted with what? With perhaps the sin that you're helping someone overcome in their effort to be restored. That's what he means. Are you a spiritual believer able to help? Are you like a spiritual lifeguard helping to bring about restoration in the life of someone who is drowning? See, Martin Luther, the reformer, said, and I don't agree with everything that he held to, but I think it's, it's worth noting that he said this, do not aggravate his grief. This is talking about how to deal with somebody who's been overtaken in sin. Do not scold him. Do not condemn him, but lift him up and gently restore his faith. That's what he said. So I looked at this and I said, well, where do we see that in Scripture? Is that just because somebody that we might consider a famous Christian said something, that doesn't mean it's true. It probably is true. I, and I wouldn't put it up if I didn't agree with it completely. But, but think about it. Do not aggravate his grief. That's like spiritually rubbing their face in what they've done, constantly bringing it up. Do not scold him. I remember one time when Johnny was about four or five, he wanted to be like Daddy and decided to try to shave his face. And he cut the top of his lip, 
and he's bleeding all over the place. That wasn't the time for me to scold him. It was for me to try to stop the bleeding. Everybody with me tonight? In that area. That's what we do sometimes with Christians. We just kind of shake our head and say, I can't believe you do that. We're not, we're not helping. We're actually making it worse. Do not condemn him. Our life should be convicting, but not condemning. But lift him up and gently restore his faith. That's what he believes ought to be done. Well, I was thinking about this. I was wrestling with this. And in my preparation this week for this lesson, I thought about this. What does it say in 2 Timothy 2.25? These are people attempting to repent. That's the context of 2 Timothy 2. It says, in meekness, instructing those that what? Oppose themselves. And that is powerful language. Who would oppose themselves? Who would bring harm to themselves? Somebody who has been overtaken in a fault. That's who. So what are we doing to help those people? Now, how we leave the service tonight matters. I don't want you to go up to somebody and say, you know what, I need to talk to you. (laughs) But maybe there's something that you need to ask yourself. Maybe you need the help. Maybe there's something that you're struggling with personally and that you're not sure how to deal with. Maybe that's something you need to talk to Andrew about or whatever it may be. But let's go to verse 2. It says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill whose law, church? Whose law? The law of Christ. You see, when we burden, bear, we're helping someone. Now, it almost seems like verse 5 is countering that. For every man shall bear his own burden. But there's something linked here that, we're, that we may miss if we're not careful. How do we truly love somebody? Well, John tells us if you see someone who is in need and say to them, be warm and filled, but you don't give them the physical things that they need, like a blanket, like some food, like some shelter, then your faith is kind of in vain. So let's not love in word, but in deed and in truth, right? Everybody follow me? Okay. So you're seeing somebody who's spiritually struggling, and you kind of just say, I'll pray for you, and you really have no intention of doing anything about it. You're you're not really bearing their burden. You're not really helping. So verse 2 is connected very much so to verse 1. And here's, and here's how. I want you to think about this. The law of our Lord and Savior is to help our neighbors in need. Too many believers pay lip service to those with heavy burdens without truly helping them. And you might say, well, Pastor Small, you sound a bit judgmental there. You don't know that we're not trying to help. I'm not saying that people aren't trying to help. But sometimes it may be that we don't know how to help or even if the help that we're offering is even worth that. So you might say, well, how do I do this? I, I need wisdom. Maybe it's a child that has fallen away, that you see that they're starting to go in a wrong direction. Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's somebody that, is, is somebody that you're close to. Maybe it is an accountability partner, and they're not really you know, going the direction that honors and glorifies God. What do I do? How do I help? How do I administer the spiritual CPR? I, I want to bear their burden. The person that you're trying to help has got to be willing to also want to be helped. That is always the case. That's why the Bible says that We help those who oppose themselves. We're we're, we're there for them. We're trying to encourage them. And sometimes it may be years and years of running till they finally get to the point where they just give up. We love our dog. We really do. I remember one time I said that I didn't really love Abby, and oh man, did I get some dirty looks. We love our dog. We really do. But when she gets loose, she is part greyhound, we're convinced, and she just goes, goes running away. Finally, we sometimes just give up. Now, I'm not usually the one chasing after her. In fact, I can't think of a time when I have done that. But, but finally, she just kind of gets tired of running. What does she do? Just like most dogs, she'll just come back. You know, we think about this with a person who's kind of chasing the wind, so to speak, like Ecclesiastes says. You, you hope that they don't make too many bad decisions, that they don't kill themselves or get to that place where they've damaged themselves so much so that they're really overtaken. Sometimes we have to be mindful of the fact that there are people, if they're true believers, that God will do things in their life to bring them back. We are not the Holy Spirit. And sometimes I think we forget that. Praying for them, confronting them, loving them, being there for them can be expressed in a number of different ways, but we are not the Holy Spirit. And sometimes that that makes things worse. Why did I bring that dog illustration about Because Abby's a sweet girl. We love her. We want her to come back. We want her to be in our house or in our yard and not, you know, too close to cars and getting run over or a truck, God forbid, all these different things. So we don't want Christians away from the fold. So if somebody happens to come back to church, we haven't seen them in a while, we want to say, hey, it's good to see you. I haven't seen you for a while. 
They know that, and you know that. Just be careful what you say to somebody. I'm just giving some loving, constructive criticism. Sometimes we don't mean anything by it, but they're already kind of perhaps on edge about it. How are we helping someone? How do we truly bear one another's burdens? And how is this a fulfillment of the law of Christ? It is seeing someone who is in need, and far more than just a physical need, or even just an emotional need, there's a spiritual need there. We're willing to help. Romans 15.1 is where I want to end tonight, and it's a really powerful verse. It says, we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. What's the context of that? Somebody know? What's the context of Romans 15? Involving what? Because we, we can't just pull a verse out of context and try to apply it to something that may not apply to. Anybody? Romans 15. What's Paul dealing with? Chapter 14 is all about offering meat to idols and eating it and so forth. All right. So who might be weak? The person that thinks, hey, it's a sin to do that. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. And then look what it says, and not to please ourselves. You know what we can do sometimes with those who are truly in need? Pretend that they don't exist. Oh, there's probably nobody in our church that's struggling. There's probably nobody that's dealing with sin. And we live in the hunky-dory Mayberry USA church, and that is not reality. You might say, what do I do? Have a spiritual metal detector going around and trying to figure out everybody's sins? That's also wrong. <laughs> but we're mindful of those who are hurting. And sometimes they may come to you overwhelmed. And I want you to understand, as the pastor of this church, I want you to know that you can come to me in a non-judgmental way to get the help that you need if you're overtaken in a fault. There may be some other people in this room that you know that you could go to. I'm not sure what to do. If I do this, it will really mess up my marriage or mess up my job or other things like that but it's better to get it taken care of rather than kicking something down the can. Notice very carefully in verse 3, church. It says, for if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, what does he do to himself? He deceives himself. You pretend to be somebody that you're not, and you're never going to get the help that you need, nor can you really deal with the problem if you're not addressing that. Therefore, let every man prove his own work. The word work there is ministry your life work. And then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. So you're responsible for your decisions. And you're responsible for the decisions that you make on a regular basis. That's why verse 5 says, for every man shall bear his own burden. You're going to give an account for what you have done. I am not going to give an account for my children. But I do have a very important responsibility to raise them properly, along with Andrea and I. And so the same is true with all of the people that we influence, especially in our church family. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Sometimes this is difficult. I know tonight when we're dealing with how to deal with people when their sin and stuff can be a hard thing. But here's what it comes down to. Biblical, Christ-honoring humility and love says to the burdened, let me help you with your burdens and needs person might say, I'm good. Or as we typically New England letters say, I'm all set. But I think that if somebody who's really hurting knows that you love, you're doing it in the proper spirit, they will say, all right. They will agree to that. They will get the help that's needed. There's the restoration that's involved in here. And we can see someone go from being an unfruitful, unproductive believer with pain and sorrow and lying and self-deception to somebody who God uses in a great and powerful way for his honor and glory. That's what we want. Is that what we want for our church? Is that what we want for the family of God? It is. And I think that's what Paul was saying. People wrestle with different things all the time. We have to just be mindful of, of the fact that there are those who are there. My final lesson in Galatians, Lord willing, will be from verses 7 through 10. You'll notice verses 11 through 18 are kind of some closing remarks and some other things that are there. I may um, talk a little bit about what's there, but really the law of sowing and reaping is what we're going to be looking at uh, the next time that I preach from this passage of Scripture. I'm curious if there's anybody has any thoughts or comments. I see a bunch of people writing down some, some notes and anything at all that we talked about tonight before we're, we're dismissed. I know sometimes this can be a, a sensitive topic, and I prayed really hard about how to deliver this message um, but nonetheless, I didn't attempt to sugarcoat what the Bible says clearly about this. I think sometimes we can be too detailed in our attempt to describe certain sins. I think, you know, 
the, the being overtaken in a fault, the word that's translated fault can be anything that has um, misaligned our right view of, of doing things properly. 